Good morning, everyone. I am Pamela Harris, and since we have some new faces in the audience, I'll tell you a little bit about GCA before we get into our presentation. Well, GCA is the Government Contractors Association. It is a small business membership organization that prides itself on educating members on how to get to government contracts. The mission is to educate, facilitate, and advocate for the small business owner. So every week here, every Wednesday, we have some form of education where members get a chance and get a chance to learn about government contracts, different things to do on how to get to those contracts. And the difference between GCA and other organizations is GCA shows you the how. It's not just what is out there. You know there's certification. You know there's a proposal right there. There are you know, relationships that have to be built. But GCA breaks down that information into chunks that is doable. I'm not going to say it's necessarily easy, but it's a somewhat understandable so that you can try to digest this and take this to your team and try to do it yourself or hire on someone to help you get that work done. So GPA has been around for about 10 years, 10, 2007. So that's only 10 years ago. Uh, in April, it will be 12 years. And uh, we love you. If, you have more, if you're interested in more information about GTA, you can see myself or our, our Madam President here, Ms. Mara Cisse, who's the local chapter president here. And we have many, many more events that we do all the time. But every Wednesday, we do a workshop like this. Now, I have two other classes I want to tell you about. One is our March Association event. In March, we know that March is, oh, look at this, Women's History Month. <laughs> so I'm glad it. And of course, everyone is invited, so it's not just the women. But we love to celebrate women because we know that we are not represented well when it comes to government opportunity and also uh, in business in general. So in, in March, we'll be celebrating women making history in the present. That's what I always say. And we'll be celebrating with our guest speaker, Ms. Phyllis Hill Slater. She'll be coming in from New York to speak on uh, all the different things that she's been on Capitol Hill about. She's been all around the world fighting for women's rights when it comes to opportunities and uh, things in HR and so forth. So we would love for you all to be here for that presentation. That's on March 12th. That's this clock here in this room. And that all, all of these, this information is on govassociation.org or govmen.com so you can register for both of them. And the other event I want to make sure everyone knows is that, yes, today is our proposal writing class. Next week is a proposal writing class as well. But we'll culminate all this with a proposal writing boot camp. And that boot camp is on March 8th. I think you all may have a flyer. Everyone can see that flyer. So on March 8th, we'll actually have a proposal writing boot camp. We know today you're going to get a lot of information, and this is going to be even more. But I'm sure you want to know that if you want to do this yourself, you may want to get a little more hand holding. So that class will be called on uh, March Friday, March 8th, here in this room from 9 to 5. We'll serve lunch as well. And I don't have a flyer to go through and talk about all of that is there, but this Kira Godfrey, who is our guide, and who is uh, going to be educating us on proposal writing, she has an extensive background when it comes to this. And uh, I'll just, I don't even think I'll do justice in trying to talk about her history. And I was like, are you going to tell me? Okay. Yeah, she'll be good. So she'll tell you about herself. And we're just glad that she's here to be able to educate us on proposal writing and management. So I'll now turn this over to Ms. Kieran, who's teaching the first part of the proposal writing class. Thank you. Thank you. Are we all set here? The online, online folks are yeah. here. Okay. Business. All right. Well, welcome. I am. I'm a walker a little bit, so I'm going to really try to sit here as much as possible. But if you see me moving, then just allow me to. I won't bear too far away from the camera. So, as Pamela mentioned, um, my name is Kira Godfrey. I am the owner of Naris Communications. I started the company back in 2007, um, mainly with the purpose of uh, um, helping people, helping companies with technical communication. So that's anything that's for anything technical, and that's how we got into proposals. I started the proposals about 2004, um, working with a large uh, military base operations service contractor, and they were uh, proposing to run the military base in Guam. And so I wrote several pieces of that, and then I was like, oh, okay, I like this proposal thing. At the time, I was a research associate for the Army. I was a contractor. Um, for the Army Environmental Policy Institute. So I'm like, okay, I have a master's in 
technical communication. I have this wonderful experience in, in government contracting. Let's just try my hand at this proposal thing. And it worked out really well. Um, and then I started to teach proposal writing for a, uh, Southern Polytechnic State University, which is now Kennesaw State. And so I taught there for about six years as an adjunct professor. Um, so I, I got, like I said, the, uh, the master's in technical communication and then went on and got the MBA. And hopefully in a few weeks, I'll be defending for my dissertation for <laughs> the Doctor of Education. So I'm excited about that. So I'm happy to be here today and I'm hoping to share um, some information with you as you begin to write proposals and enter to this wonderful realm. I love proposal writing. I have a passion for it, mainly because it's, it's where the technical side, like I explained last week, is where the technical side meets the persuasive writing. And how do you sell on paper? How do you have an evaluator look at your document, your business on paper, and say, yes, I think this company is our best choice to do this service, to provide this service for us, especially in the midst of other companies also making a bid. So how do you do that, and what does that structure look like? All right, so um, let me ask you guys a question. So how many of you have written a proposal before, and you have written a, an actual proposal in response to an RFP, a request for proposal? Good, all right. And so how many of you then have seen an RFP, or at least have read, and you know what an RFP structure looks like? Okay, so a few more hands. Enough. So, so it's safe to say that the whole concept of writing a proposal and reading an RFP is new for most people. Okay. All right. So that's so that's where we need to start. In order to write a proposal, you it's so many things that need to be done be, before you get to that writing phase, before you can sit down and actually start typing. And so, what I want to do is start from the beginning. Exactly, how does this proposal writing profession, this process, how does it fit inside the big equation of business development? This is how most businesses make money these days. As normally back in the day was by a handshake. <laughs> Nowadays, mainly, it's through writing an RFP. A company, if I want to buy a, uh, lots of cell phones for my organization, I'm going to write an RFP and I'm going to send it out to certain companies, maybe send it out to Sprint, T-Mobile, and they're going to go ahead and, and um, reply with a quote and an action. They're going to tell me how wonderful their warranty is and their service plans and their connections and all their hotspots. And they're going to sell me on their process and their product. And so that's really what we're doing. Okay. All right. So let's get started here. Yeah. All right. So yes, I am an instructor. So therefore, I'm going to have some course objectives. <laughs> Can't help it. Um, so we're going to look here as we're going through this process. I want to identify the role of proposals in the business acquisition process. Again, you're trying to acquire a business, and so and proposals play a strong role in that. We're going to talk about the core team and the business development process. Um, many companies have their own business, the process that works for them. And I'm just going to show you the general process. Um, and then you may find that, hey, I, I want to take something away, or I may want to add some more to it. That's perfectly fine. I'm going to show you a general process that's going to get you from point A to point B. Um, recognize the role and responsibilities of a proposal manager. And in this, in this case, you may be the writer and the manager. I know it's likely that's the case, and that's okay. <laughs> I just want to make you aware of what those roles are. Um, and also, we'll talk about the, the writer, and then, of course, recognize the components of the federal um, RFP and how they look and what's the general structure that they uh, may come in. Um, so you can recognize as you're beginning to write and outline your proposals. So our agenda today, then, we'll talk about the business acquisition cycle, go through, talk about proposal management, proposal development process. We're going to talk about the value proposition, the win things, um, and also your, your discriminators. What makes your company unique in offering the service that you provide? Everybody does certain things, may provide the same service, but what makes your company unique in the way you provide the service? You're going to have to know that because you're going to have to talk about it in the proposal. That's what you're going to be writing about. Um, also, I'm going to talk about proposal writing and, and some processes for um, how you actually go through that process. And then uh, talk about some team reviews. Team reviews are going to start hearing this term. Okay, what is a 
red team and pink team and blue team. Have you guys heard those terms before yeah. yet? Yeah. Okay. yeah, you're gonna hear a lot about those, especially the reason why you may say, oh, I'm a small business, I don't need to know all that, we don't need to have all these team reviews. Well, the reason why I thought it was important to add to this presentation, because one day you may be a sub, or you may be a teaming partner for a larger company, and they're gonna be using this process. So you wanna, you wanna make sure that you know the lingo and you know exactly what your role is. So they're gonna say, hey, um, could you provide somebody for our red team review? And you don't wanna be like, red team review? What does that mean? I'm gonna share with you with some red team review. So now, you may not use it now, but show you that you're familiar with it, um, so of course, as you think about, as you're going to be growing your business, you're prepared for it, okay? And then, of course, print and delivery, because of course, once you create the proposal, how are you gonna get it to the customer? How are you gonna print it? What are you gonna do? I'm not gonna talk about everything, but I'm just gonna to touch on it, so in the back of your mind, you're made aware that as I write this document, I need to be concerned about um, if you, I'm uploading it, so they may have a, a site and you can say, hey, upload your document by such and such a time, and you'll, it can only be five minutes. Well, let's make sure you write your document, you put your graphics in there, and you stay within the size limit, and how are you going to get it to the size? And also, if they say, hey, we want five copies. Well, how are you going to make those five copies? Are you going to bind it? Are you going to spiral bind it? And what are you going to do? How are you going to do that? We're just going to touch on that, because that's a part of something that writers need to be aware of. And then of course, um, the post um, submittal activities and those include, you submit a proposal, and then sometimes the government may say, hey, we, we narrow down the companies that we want to go forward with. And so they may say, hey, as of after the proposal, come back and we'll do an oral presentation. You're going to have several companies come in and they're going to give an oral presentation. That's a part, that's something, a function that a proposal development department would do. Or they may say, hey, we have some discussion questions and clarification questions. As a proposal writer, you're going to be um, responsible for answering those questions. Or they may say, hey, we've got some price differences. We want your best and final offer. And so you're going to be working on that. So all these things happen after the proposal has been submitted. Okay? A lot to know today. So please, um, I know this session has been recorded. So take your notes. And afterwards, we also you can ask any questions that you may have. Okay? So this is just to touch on the big picture items, almost to scare you a bit, <laughs> to say, oh crap, I really need to make sure that I pay attention and oh, I need to make sure that I'm well prepared, okay? All right, All right so just really quick, we talk about the, the business acquisition cycle. So every company, you have a strategic planning process where you're actually going through defining your market. This is my, these are my prospects, this is my market, this is the space where I, I work. Um, and then after you go through, especially when you find an opportunity, you're like, okay, I want to say, all right, my state's now um, planning to go into DOD. I want a Department of Defense. I want to start working for the Department of Defense and be one of their um, contractors and providing the service. So then you have the capture management. You have this person or you, <laughs> as you know, the business. You may go out and start getting information about um, opportunities that the Department of Defense may have. So that's your opportunity assessment, your second different opportunity within the um, organization of the Department of Defense. And then you start with, um, capturing information, capturing intelligence about them. What are their hot button items? What exactly are they, what did they buy last year? What are they buying this year? Are there any, um, are there any initiatives that the federal government is about to take, uh, about to take on? over the next few years, and maybe there's an RFP that's going to expire, or a proposal or contract that's going to expire. Normally they are about, you know, can be anywhere from like three, three years or five years, and maybe you know, okay, next year I know that one, is another proposal or RFP is going to come out. And so now you're positioning yourself to get ready for that opportunity when it comes out. And then once it comes out, we're going through that proposal management process. And it's just a cycle, and this is the big bucket um, cycle or items that take place in that business acquisition process. As you acquire business, this is the process that typically would take place. Again, you may not be in these buckets right now, or you know, you might say, well, I don't, I don't need this right now. Everything is all in one for me right now. I got one circle. I don't need <laughs> three. And that may, and that may be you. Um, but nevertheless, we're thinking about growth. And so yeah. again, a larger company will have these and you want to be know exactly where you fit in that process for them. All right, so proposal management. 
for management of self is a uh, you're looking you're managing the document and the process so it's, you get an RFP what do you do it's the management of the process that takes you from now here is what I'm going to do I'm going to read it I'm going to make sure I have my team together or if I'm going to be the, uh, the butcher the baker and the candlestick maker if you're doing everything then you set your schedule okay on this day I'm going to write an outline I'm going to read the RFP I'm going to highlight okay resumes okay let me make sure I have all my resumes are they asking for a subcontracting plan okay they're asking for a management plan and they're asking for a technical approach okay let me get that together all right they want a quality um, a quality assurance plan let me outline my proposal document based on what is it that they're asking for this is the role of the manager the process and the document and the writing comes into place once you're ready, once you have your information. But now, before you can even get to writing, there are some steps that happen. And this is the management side of it. Being organized. It's a very um, legal process. It's, a, it's contracting. Because that proposal, once you win, it turns into the contract. Okay? So from the get-go, you need to make sure that you're really managing carefully so you don't miss anything. Because the one thing that's going to throw you out, even before they read your proposal, is you're not compliant. You didn't include what they asked for. They asked to be in one-inch margins all around, and you know you, you didn't do that. Uh, they asked you for um, 12, font, uh, 12 uh, font size, point font size, and you didn't do that. You did the whole the old college. 14 and maybe they just don't know you know make this paper look real fluffy <laughs> my niggas like I got a whole lot of content because uh, my students use it all the time they start tweaking stuff and changing make it look more than what it really was so most times they'll tell you hey we either want times new Roman or we want arrow so you like to home up you know, the around work when they're asking for something <laughs> what they want and so you want to make sure you can find the proposal manager makes sure that all these things take place, make sure that you are aware of this whole this entire process. Okay. So right here, responsible for identifying the source um, resources necessary, performing a thorough analysis of the solicitation of the RFP, looking at it carefully, going through each step. I'm going to talk about what those steps are, those areas in the RFP that they need to look at. And so finally, here refining the estimates. When you create the schedule, you create the schedule from the day you see the RFP to the day that that's you. It's going to tell you which day, which time that the RFP is due. All this information is in there. So again, the manager's job is to go through the entire document to make sure all of that gets done in the document, in the final document. So this is what a typical team may look for. You may have the capture manager, and again, all these, and that's okay. I just want you aware of the many hats you will have to wear throughout this process. It's a very detailed process. This is not a process that uh, people are fool for this. This is what they do. They receive certification, the whole uh, association of proposal management professionals. It's here in Atlanta, we have a chapter here. And so it literally is a group of proposal managers that we get together. So I'm a member actually, I'm speaking at the conference next, next, next month. But get together and we talk about proposals. And then they get a graphic designer that strictly does graphics for proposals. Or writers that only focus on proposals. Managers only focus on proposals. This is how business is done. There are large companies in there, every company um, has a proposal development department. They may sit in the marketing department or they may sit in sales. Or they may have their own department, but everyone does it. This is how this is All right. You have your capture person, your proposal manager, ready to know the capture is giving you all that good information about the, the client, um, and then the proposal management process. The coordinator, the coordinator is the person who you may have on the team that's really focused on getting the documents together. Um, they may ask for, hey, maybe uh, you want your bond letter, or we, do you have a insurance we want your insurance letter uh, all these different things the, the proposal coordinator is managing the document itself making sure all the different pieces get into the document they may be setting up the meetings for you 
um, and ensure that all your teaming partners come in and you're actually set up. So they're coordinating the process. So they, they really help the proposal manager in a great way. Um, then you have volume leads. If it's big, this, then this is really big, big proposals, you may have different volumes. You may have a, a subcontract volume or past performance volume or management volume or technical volume or volume. And then you have, if it's large like that, then you have different volume managers. Um, and then of course you have the proposal writer. The proposal writers are assigned the volume or assigned a session, a session or a section, and they're the ones that actually writing the document. The volume managers managing the volume, capture, uh, it's all worked together. Everybody knows their role. And of course you have the subject matter experts. Very rarely would you find a proposal writer that's versed in every area. They know the technical approach, um, they know uh, everything that's being done, they know the management, they know all your past performance. So in that case, you use a lot of subject matter experts. These are people in the field or in your company that knows exactly how something is done. Um, if, you, if it's a, a medical process, they actually understand all the intricate details of the, of the process that you're working on, whatever the case may be of what that is. So you will have subject matter experts. The, the goal of the writer then is to work with that subject matter expert and being able to ask the right questions. How do you do that? When do you do that? How do we know that's correct? How, what, what's the process? Okay, what happens after that? Okay, what happens before that? So who is doing that? So the proposal writer is asking these questions to understand the rhetorical situation, understand exactly what's happening, and they're interviewing the subject matter expert to get this information. Most subject matter experts, um, they, either they'll interview, go through, agree to do an interview, or they may write something. And sometimes there's a lot of jargon <laughs> when the subject matter expert may give you, but that's the whole role of a writer. You, you now be able to break down that information and really explain. This is where technical communication comes in and why writers become so important, especially people who, who are writers, at least understand the business. Technical communication is where you're taking technical information and, and you being able to explain it to a non-technical audience. That's the role and the whole purpose of a technical communicator. And that's what a proposal writer does as well. You're taking that, that information and being able to um, um, break it down. All right, pre-proposal preparation. Here's a wonderful bracket that's just saying exactly some of the things that need to be done. Um, you form your core team, you analyze the RFP, develop a baseline solution. Okay, this is what I'm thinking that we're going to give them. Um, develop your, your price baseline roughly. Um, the reason why I say baseline is because these will be refined over the period of the proposal. Um, you can come up with your initial plan. Okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to attack it this way. Um, you accept assembly your team, you create your storyboards. So I'm going to start about this, and this is the process, and here exactly what you're going to do. Um, come up with your um, competitive analysis too, update it. Because again, the great part of business development, you need to know your business, you need to know your clients or the prospect, their business, and you need to know the business of your competitors too. <laughs> what do you think they may be offering? Because especially like we talked about last week, where you have the opportunity to do some ghostwriting um, or ghosting, not ghostwriting, but ghosting. Um, so, but you need the way to do that. The only way you can do that is if you know what your users are up to. And of course, um, you can update updating the black hat and continue uh, continue the, the price to win analysis. And the black hat is real more so your your, your win strategy, your thinking, your process that you're going through. Sure. Do you have access to these um, slides? This um, is being recorded. Yes. Okay. So through GCA, you have access to the recording. Yes. But the slides itself. The slides itself. No, we have access. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So now we get to the proposal development. We did all of that. Now we're actually going to develop a proposal. So this is where we're actually going through the whole process. And again, this is just a um, an ideal or an example. You're going to take away and pull out exactly what you may need as you go through the process. So you're preparing the, the author's guidance. So as the manager as well, you're giving, you don't just give the RFP and to the writer and say, okay, write. No, you, you, you give them guidance. You actually say, this is what I want you to focus on. Um, we have a great uh, process here. Um, we're the only company that has this technology. 
I want to make sure that you mention that. I want you to talk about the greatness of this technology or this product that we have and what it does and how what are the benefits and features of this product. And so you're giving your, your writer's guidance. So you have your kickoff meeting, and we always do, because it's just like any project. You, proposals is something that if you know anybody, if you know any proposal writers, and then who's been doing this for a long time, it can burn you out. They're very, it's a stressful job, not because the work is hard, it's because you're up against a deadline. And sometimes when you have these deadlines and you know that, let's say, I really need my company to, to win this opportunity or my company's spending a lot of money just to play, you know, and, and whether they have some contractors. And you're thinking, this is a, a lot of stress. I know this has to be good. It's almost like somebody telling you, hey, write your best, you know, give a speech and write it in five minutes. And you're like, but why do you need to? You know, it's, 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 it's nerve wracking. <laughs> it's time to press submit or, or put a, you know, a, 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 a document in the mail and you're holding on to it. Steps 
I think they were allowed to do the visual images. It was less tense. Yeah. So, so you were less intimidated. You were intimidated. Less intimidated. Less intimidated. Like, as so, opposed to all, if all this was in a paragraph. Right. Right. Yeah. So you broke it down easy to read, easy to look at, and step by step. Step by step process, especially when you start looking at the roadmap quickly in your mind. Step by step process of oh, oh. stuff. Oh. Mm -hmm. And then you, and then you're really thinking to yourself, oh. They know a step by step. I mean, you even know a step by step process, even to put it down on paper. So it really tells something about you and your business just by the way you use your graphics. It, it, it says something. It, it says more than what you could ever put on the page. Right. Yeah. And it's overwhelming, but in a less it's overwhelming way than it would be yeah. if it were, because I imagine that would be about paper. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. and, and there is, and this goes to the SOP. But I'm not going to show you the SOP. I just need to see really quick. And to really understand the biggest thing I want to get out there is understand that there is a process. It's not just sitting down and writing. You have to think through so this critical thinking of how you want to do this, how you want to position your business to, to win, at least where you get a seat at the table, at least where you make it to the next round. Where they come back to you and even ask you, hey, could you give a presentation? Or could you come up back and give us your best and final offer? All right, and then so um, conduct your reviews and respond to comments, produce the proposal, um, and then of course your delivery plan and how you want to do that and get your sign off. Again, you're you're the butcher the baker, you're it for your business right now. So it's, it's just making sure that you know that there is a process and these are the various steps and hats that you're going to wear throughout this process. Okay. All right, so this is where some um, reading comes in, but the two things I want to show you here is more so that that proposal development phase um, what we're looking at really through this process again making it compliant and then making it compelling and when we talk about making it compliant is it's easy to evaluate um, easy to evaluate and respond to each requirement of the rfp the rfp tells you exactly what they want and you're being able to show that you are responsive to each requirement, and then of course being compelling that your solution that you created, that this is how we, the RFP says, you know, we, we want this, we, we want um, uh, we want five people who are going to be administrative assistants, and they're going to keep our records, and they're going to do all these different things. How are you going to supply these five people? And what are you going to do to make sure that they come to work every day and they're happy about their work and the government has no problem? Because they know your business, your company is taking care of it. So what are you, what are you going to do? What's your solution that gives that assurance? Or maybe it's a highly technical field. Right now there is a, a shortage of a lot of behavioral health professionals. So let's say there is a contract and you provide behavioral health um, professionals. How are you going to make sure that these people stay? Do you have a pool of behavioral health professionals? How are you going to source those positions different than somebody else? So this is where the strategic and the planning comes into play, and looking at their issue and then how are you going to meet that need? Okay. So again, we're still talking about the proposal manager. So you're responsible again for developing the overall proposal. And again, this may be you. The, uh, the proposal, the writer, you're the captain manager, you're the graphic designer, you're the desktop publisher, you're the subject matter expert, you're, you're all of it, you're it. <laughs> you're it. <laughs> and so, again, making sure that you're aware. So, one thing I wanted to show here was just that that proposal manager and the capture manager working hand in hand, that the proposal manager was focused on the, proposal, the writing of the proposal and making sure it's developed. And taking all the client's needs, all the things that the client that they're looking for, and being able to translate that um, over to the proposal. So they're, the proposal manager and the capture managers working hand in hand to make sure that that solution is, is getting um, in the document itself. Okay. All right. So this is something I'm not going to go through. This just showing again. It's another way of saying there's a process. Okay. There's a distinct process in place here, um, looking through the proposal every step of the way, and there's some draft reviews as you go through the process itself. Um, one thing I'm sure this is not for you to see, but this is just for you, just again, to get an idea that, oh crap, there's a lot of things that need to be done, <laughs> and we have a timeline of what we need to do it. That's all you need to get from this right here. It's not to read. Just do you, you know. do you like questions along the way? Or, uh, oh, sure. Okay. 
So is, um, one of my questions was as far as the how you actually manage the proposal process. Is it with a Gantt chart? Is that kind of the best way that you found to do that, the actual? A Gantt chart. I, okay. I find the Gantt chart to be um, very helpful, but I also use Excel spread, um, just an Excel spreadsheet where okay. I have all the dates. Um, and then I populate it and then I put it to a calendar. Like some of my clients like to actually see the dates on the actual right. calendar. But starting off with a, a Gantt chart, I mean, so what I'm, the reason why I'm saying that you can also do it in Excel, because um, right. Microsoft Projects is, is not a part of the regular Microsoft package. Right. So it's, it's an extra expense, but you can do the same thing in Excel. Okay. Well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the Shakita is here, and Shakita is, is actually a senior proposal manager for a very large um, defense contracting company. So, do you want to add to that? Like, would you find maybe uh, best software for managing a proposal? Would you say advanced as well? Um, from an administrator um, yeah. standpoint, I would definitely say that yeah, it's easier for me because you can add all the tasks in, right. the subtasks, like I do the resourcing. So, because I have multiple ones at one time, I understand how much time I price your needs on one opportunity versus another opportunity. Mm -hmm. for, so from an administrator standpoint, yes. However, for my team, I give them a calendar, how to code team, great team, team, good team. They know when they need to show up places, they know when things are due. So when they see a physical calendar, they'll, it's easier for them to just be able to take that information in because it could be overwhelming. Okay, so the proposal manager needs the Gantt chart to know everything, yeah. and then the, the, the doers need yeah. to do the calendar. Like I said, from the A to B, dates on there, do well, questions are due, answers, you know, here's yes. back or whatever. Yeah. Great team, gold team, all that stuff. They have cost and reviews, like they need that. But all the other right. subtasks, the mini subtasks, yeah, that, that would be overwhelming for them. They would scare them. Okay. Yeah. And, and one, one thing I want to point out there is that's also a part of, as a proposal manager, you, you're working with a lot of people. And so being able to, again, Looking at your audience, mm -hmm. what how what format of information I need to put this in so they can receive it and they can do what they need to do, and that that's going to be a, a big part of being successful in business development. Always thinking about your customers, always thinking about the audience. It's not what you want to say; it's what they need to know. It's not your best format; it's the best format they need in order to receive the information. Okay, so always thinking about your, your customer, always thinking about your customer. Yeah. yeah. On the chart, all the accounts that you have is from the previous chart that you had. Yes, yes. So so the roadmap uh, yeah. chart, those those steps are in, you make them a part of the hand, and you may even break those down into more more steps. Yeah. Exactly. All right, so let's make sure we're doing our time. We're doing pretty good if we can get through it all. So this is the foundation right here. Again, understanding your customers. Do your homework. Understand who they are. I would love to say that everything you need to know about your customer is in the RFP. I would love to tell you that. Mm -hmm. That's not true, though. That's, that's not true. The, the, the customer who's actually doing the work and the team that actually wrote the RFP are two different people. They're two different sets of people. You have your contracting office within the, the um, the government that actually writes the RFP, but they are working with the with the clients who's actually do who's actually going to benefit from the services you provide. And so sometimes there are in, this in, additional information that you need to know. And so doing your homework, doing your research, going on the, on the internet, talking to different people. Um, that 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 uncle or your neighbor who used to work for the military back in whatever. <laughs> That's the time to call them up. Hey, I need to know you have any buddies in you know this particular department. Uh, do you know? This is the time when you actually listen to the go to the like, looking at CDC, go into the Surgeon General, go into the Department of Health and Human Services website, seeing the initiatives that they have. They all have strategic plans. What's in their five-year strategic plan? What's in their ten-year plan? What's coming up? And being able to know what items are are. Um, hot on their on their agenda. What are their hot buttons? What are they looking for? And then they can talk about that. Um, again, a pair of understanding the players in the space, understanding your competitors, understanding your partners, what they offer, and what and what they're what's in the RFP that you know you do well, 
and where do you need to partner with somebody because you may, that may not be a strength. Don't just throw it away. So, oh, I can't do that, so I'm not going to pursue that opportunity. No. Okay, let's see who, who do we know that can actually we can partner with and go and do this together. Um, again, uh, like we talked about building those relationships, it's going to be very important to build building those relationships. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the value proposition. When we talk about the value proposition, this is again another way of saying what value you have a product, you have a service. But what the, what is the value of that pro that uh, product or service that you have that you're proposing? So as a result of our, the way we do this thing or our process or our approach or our team, as a result of this, our years of experience, our past performance, you, what value will the government experience because of what you have? And you have to be able to articulate that. You have to be able to write that down and know exactly what it is because then that becomes the framework for your themes and your discriminators. You have to go through an exercise where you actually sit down, what do they need, what do they have, what value do we have? Not just because you do it, there may be other people that do it and they may do it better, but they don't do it just the way you do it. There's something you add to that that makes it better. Okay? And so being able to understand what value are you proposing. Um, um, then once you look at the values that you're proposing, then you look at, okay, what's my, my win theme? Am I the low cost, am I the low cost provider? Do I have high, a high tech solution? Um, what, am I the lowest risk? What is it that you want to make sure that is resonating throughout your proposal? So this is something that you may mention in your, from your management plan. You want to put this in your executive summary. You want to make sure to mention these things in your transmittal letter. You're going to mention these things in your technical approach and maybe your call out box. What is it that, what's that theme that's going to resonate throughout your proposal that wherever they look, they're going to bump into, bam, this is, this, this is the theme. This is what our company is offering or what we can do. And this is how we do it. This is, the degree to what we do it so well or that, that we're offering. And especially if you have proven performance, if you have an award or what is it, what's going to make them say yes, what's that, sh if we do these things, we don't, we have a good shot of winning. Because if you don't think you're going to win, you really shouldn't write your proposal. You only write when you, win, when you think you're going to win. When you think, because you ask, always ask yourself that question, can we win? If you think there's a possibility for you to win, with your solution, go for it. If you like, I don't know. Don't waste your money any time. So, but to build yourself up, to feel that you can win, you, you gotta sometimes, you know, strategize. And you know, sometimes my clients, we just sit in front of a whiteboard and we just strategize and, and go through it. It's it's a it's a brainstorming session. Nobody's expecting to know everything. It's like, okay. Oh, they, oh yeah, I remember we did this before, and you know, you may not have seen it a certain way. Okay, yeah, that could fit into that bucket. Yeah, well, that's not past performance, but that'll work. And you start thinking about it, and you get other people around you and really help you brainstorm and strategize how you want to come up with those new things. All right, let's talk a little bit about discriminators, because we talk about discriminators a lot. So these are attributes that, again, from your business that are unique. What do you do that's unique? What's your unique solution? You've got all this great information from your capture manager. You know your customer. You know what they want. What makes your company unique than all the other companies? And again, if you're thinking, ooh, I ain't really got nothing unique, man. Well, think hard, or you may just need to, you know, get to do something. You got to make yourself unique, there's a lot of competition out there. And you have something, and you, and you may just can't see it, that's fine, but then you get some people around you who can see what you may not be able to see, or reinforce what you already know, okay? So what is it that only your team can do? And, and the biggest part of it is really making sure that it's something that the customers can value, or have a value for. So real quick, I have this, she 
something? Did you increase something? Your product or your service caused um, a reduction in cost or risk or whatever it is. Did you improve something because of your product or service? Not that you improved it, but you improved it and a customer, that a previous customer benefited from it. Yes. So you improved it and the previous customer benefit. Again, it's always about the customer, it's always about your audience. It's not, it's not, this is one case where it's not about you. <laughs> it's about the customer. What is it that you've done? What is it that you provide and that they see value in it and they have benefited from it? What is a feature that you have? A feature of your service. <clears throat> And that there is clear benefit. If they do it your way, they will receive. They they will receive something. Or there is a. If they do it your way, they follow your process. If they use your people, they'll have something great. And what is that? Uh, I would ask somebody to share, but if not, you can share after the class. You guys can share. What is it that you do? Okay. What is it that you do? That's so great. Okay. So again, this is an exercise you can you can take back and you can do this. You, you should do this. <laughs> it's a must that you do this exercise um, with your team and the people that that know your business. Um, maybe some as a previous. Uh, Somebody has worked for you in the past and really getting them into a room and say, okay, you know what? What did we do that was so great? What makes us great? Or asking a previous customer, what made us so great? You came back several times. Why? And really being able to pull that information and solidifying what that is. All right. So, so for those of you who have an RFP, and we'll come back to this exercise, you can continue working on it. Um, for those of you who do have an RFP yet, how many people like? since we added more people to the room since we first started. How many people have an RFP that you, you're, you want to write a proposal in response to? So you have an RFP, okay, so that's All right, so this is what to do. Whether you have an RFP or whether you don't. If you don't have an RFP, you want to be able to go to uh, the computer and be able to get an RFP from an agency that you're most interested in. And it should be a previous one. So you go to Fed, Fed Biz Ops. They have some previous proposals on RFPs on there. And you just want to get an idea of how one looks. Um, they do something in the past, and you can see, oh, okay, this is this is how this is how you do something like this. Or and, and you really get an idea, uh, okay, that proposal again ended. Uh, well, that contract will end next year. Well, we need to maybe get the previous RFP. So 
well, let me see if they don't change a whole lot. You can use that one to start getting an idea to position your, your business for the one that's coming out next year. So you, we, need to, we talk a lot about that forecasting and the pipeline, and, and that's the topic for next week's session um, uh, of really looking at your proposals as an RFP and getting ready. All right. All right. So you're able to then draft a little bit of an RFP um, of your proposal based on the previous proposal. Now, you may ask yourself, okay, I can get the RFP, but could I get the previous winning proposal? Could I see what the incumbent, so the person, the company is actually doing the work right now, that's called the incumbent. They're the ones that are actually controlling the work now. So could you get the, uh, the proposal from the incumbent of what they may have submitted? And in some cases you can, in most cases you can, um, is using the, uh, is the Freedom of Information Act that you can write a letter to the contracting office and you can say, hey, based on this Freedom of Information Act, um, I am requesting the proposal. Oops, this is one. Sorry. <laughs> And you can you can definitely do that. All right. So for those of you who have not seen an RFP as of yet, um, I'm just going to share with you really quick the, the basic components of a federal RFP. So they're basically in, in various sections, and you'll see section A, and we'll go through all these different things. I'm just going to put them all here, but they're in chunks here. And then you're going to go by the alphabet. And mainly DOD does a great job of, of, of sticking to this, this alphabet. Um, and there are some other federal agencies. They have, the, they have the, the information here, but they'll have it separated by the alphabet the way that this, this is. So sometimes you may hear, oh my goodness, I, I got this RFP. And, and sometimes somebody will say, well, go to section L. We want to see how the, that's the preparation. It tells you exactly how is it that you're going to prepare how, what's the format they want to see the, the proposal from you? And so you go to section uh, section um, L for that. And you're like, oh, what, what's the, the statement of work? Oh, so then you need to go to section C. That's going to tell you the statement of work. So you're looking at the document. So the reason why I'm showing this to you, I don't want you to feel overwhelmed when you see this document. <laughs> Sometimes they're pretty big. I mean, for the large opportunities, um, it can be about seven, seven pages. But the content is the same in each one of those that they have, not the content, but they have the, the buckets of categories are the same. And again, it may not be by the alphabet, but you're going to see the statement of work. You're going to see where they're going to ask you for, um, for your pricing. They're going to give you what's the evaluation criteria. And if they say, hey, we want to evaluate you based on your past performance, that's going to be, it never is this, but let's say it's going to be 60% based on past performance. And you know, oh crap, I need to make sure I, say, I spend close attention to my past performance because they weighed it and they tell you past performance may be 60%, your technical approach may be 10%, your management may be another 10%. It's never that, but I'm saying that it could be. Whatever those numbers are, it gives you an idea from a writing perspective where you need to make sure that you focus because you want to go after the most points, okay? So they're evaluating based on the point approach. So that, that section M becomes quite important. So you get the RFP, when it arrives, you're reading it, and you're conducting your kickoff meeting, you're making sure your team is in place, um, you have all your, your writers again, you create the schedule, even if it's you and you're by yourself, still create the schedule, because it keeps you on point to know what you need to do and by when. There are a lot of competing interests for your time because the reality is you're the one probably doing the work now and then you're going to have to find some time within your day of already doing work to now do your business development. So section time off exactly for your day every day of how you want to attack this proposal and make sure that it's ready for um, by the, and submitted by the date that it's due. Our late proposals, um, uh, did the government make an exception because, let's say, 
the courier didn't make it there and, and, and it was a really bad accident or the courier even is now in the hospital. Would the government say, oh man, that's really, yeah, go ahead and, and give it to me, I, I understand. Or, you know, that flight was delayed. There was a terrible storm in Chicago or DC and that, you know, didn't get there. Or that, that base was shut down and we could not get to the contracting office. Or well, whatever it is, if it's shut down, then maybe. But if there was like a, a storm or something, are they going to uh, submit, uh, accept your proposal because there was a storm? How many think they'll accept it? How many think they'll accept it? No, they're not. They're not going to accept it. Go ahead. Just curious, is there any value of getting, getting in sooner than later? I mean, any, I'm sure there are no cool points in this process. Right. Right. I'm just curious if there's any value with getting it in, like if you're first or Yeah, no. Okay. No, no. Um, yeah, no. <laughs> okay. Once, yeah, and the person who got it in the day before, the person who got it in 10 minutes before, and the value will be the same. Yeah. Now, at least you know the one who gets it in late. You don't have to worry about that one. <laughs> but yeah, no, any late proposal. There's no leeway, no give me a second chance. You can cry, you can beg, you can plead. No. Now, what about when they send out a request to extend oh, the deadline? Yeah. Now they extend the deadline? Yes. Yeah. They'll usually um, send out an a, a amendment and then they extend the deadline and they ask you to sign the amendment, make sure you acknowledge that you receive this. So, what can you take from that? So, my boss submitted for. Um, uh, uh, contract and they extended the deadline. I think that they didn't get enough entries. Is that because, like, do we know if there is like any underlying reason? No, I mean, there's so many different reasons. So, during that QA session, sometimes I'm, I've been on opportunities where we ask for an extension. Hey, you know, when you're asking for this, you're asking for that. Um, is there any way that the government will consider an extension? And you know, sometimes they may grant it, so maybe somebody else asks for an extension, or um, maybe the scope may have changed, and they'll tell you where, where it has changed. Or um, in many cases, they may they may receive so many questions that they did not get the answers back to the companies in enough time, and so they're going to extend it because there's usually something about those answers that's going to help you form their solution, so they will give you more time because they took a longer time. Um, with the art, with the RFP, I'm sorry, with the questions. So therefore, yeah, it's, it's not a. It can be various reasons why that may happen. So if they have um, put in a last minute amendment, amendment for an extension, mm -hmm. and uh, you've already submitted, that still stands. The extension, the extension still stands. Yes. Well, no, the proposal, proposal submitted still stands. The, no. You don't have a chance to. No, you could submit a, another one. Now, so annoying. So, here's how the, and proposals that we, you know, at least we want to have our binders done and have something done, and you know, we'll have the date on the cover and everything's already printed. All we need to do is put the document inside the binder, or we may be finished in a certain section. Then here comes the extension. Yeah. it. All that work you went through, <laughs> you know, now you keep changing your headings and changing the dates throughout the whole document. So normally if there is, if it's just an extension and nothing else has changed and you're okay with what you have, certainly. But if you, if you have more time, you can do it again if you, if you want. So in this kind of piggybacks on your question, which, you know, it comes back again, you know, so there's no real advantage to trying to get it in a week early. Oh, no. Right. No, 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 yeah, you don't even want to do that. Okay. Yeah. You okay. want to spend this process of solutioning and writing, it takes a while. Yeah. It takes a while to really go through and really understand exactly what is it that you want to say. We have these, um, and we're going to go through these team reviews. Okay, we're start here. All right. So we have all these team reviews that we're going to go through, and you really, there's, hey, do we, the first pink team review, did we even answer the question? You know, do, do we even do we have this information? So you want to review that, and then is our solution really a solution that they're asking for, and that technical solution? 
And then, then are the, the owners of the company, are they pleased with the with the um, the solution? You want to have your subject matter experts, have them look at it. Maybe they just answered one question, but have them look at the entire document. All these things take so much time, you're going to need every moment that you can possibly get. And if you finish a proposal a week before it's due, then get, get, get scared. <laughs> they feel like, oh crap, I'm missing know that you probably missing something. Yeah. You know, there's always a case that you don't have enough time. That you never have. At least I've not been in it. Put this way, I've not been in a situation that there was too much time um, to put together a proposal. It's a lot, it's a lot of work. Um, and, and I'll show you my proposal. Okay, so. We talk quickly. I just want to show you then this outline. So you outline the document again. Everything that they're asking for, go ahead and, and place it in. The outline comes like a table of contents, where you actually put it through everything that they they are going to see within this document, and then you're beginning to populate that table of contents. You're populating the outline with your actual content. So all of this is based on the RFP. That's what we got in the RFP and be able to break down exactly what is it that they're asking for. They want, and they may want to know your HR plan. They may want to know your staffing matrix. Well, how do you know how many people you need unless you understand the state of work, what's the work that needs to get done? And so you ask, then the question may be, hey, could you show us your current staffing matrix? That's a question that you can submit to the government and asking them for this information that they may have. So you're creating the outline and it has to fit exactly with the RFP. Again, these are things that's done even before you're writing because it makes your writing a whole lot easier. All right, so let's talk quickly then about some of these reviews. Um, so when you're looking at the team, that's very, that's, that's how you have your team when you're talking about what is it, it's our value proposition, you're going through themes and all that information. Um, it, it really, and you may have heard this phrase before, and I'm going to say it because it's really true. Your proposal is just telling a story about your business. It's, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's storytelling that's fine as well. I mean, it's storytelling, it's persuasive writing, it's, it's selling on paper, it's, it's, it's a skill that truly it, it, yeah, it's for a writer being able to articulate your thoughts. However, it's about knowing your business and knowing the client's business. And I would tell people as you're writing a proposal, just just with everything in your head, just write it. You can clean it up. Just get it out. Even if you record yourself and then transcribe it, but if you write, get it out on paper exactly. Is you want to say, hey, how are you going to manage this contract? Are you going to have several meetings? What's, what's, what's the status report that you're going to give to the government? Most times they're going to tell you what they want, and so you, you tell them how are you going to do it. You know, so that's what you do. You tell them how you're going to do it. All right. The, the last, could you just explain what the last bullet meant? The mailing response. So, I know. <laughs> so it's it's John. So we, we call it answering the mail. So if, if the government is asking for whatever they're asking for, we're answering, we're responding. I know it's, it's, in proposal, you'll see a, a lot of little phrases people say, and um, you're like, oh, okay. So answering the mail is really where you're just answering, you're being responsive, um, compliant with the RFP. Are, are you answering the question that they're, they're asking um, in that section? Some proposals, they may give you a case study, and hey, tell us what you're doing in this situation. And you can't be able to answer mail. I know we're saying so. That's the regular language. Um, but yeah, just being responsive. Now, a uh, question for you. We talked about how the taxpayers out there are kind of gathering the intel about, you know, looking at forecasts and for five years, strategic plan, and all that kind of stuff. Is, is that included in this part of it, or is that included in a later? It, it, this part of it, this okay. is the first part. Okay. This is the <coughs> capture manager is getting all this information. Manager, most times the capture manager is leading this, this session. So they're telling you exactly what is it that they found, and you put it all into a, a PowerPoint, and then this becomes the 
spaces then of your kickoff meeting. And so you're sharing all that good information. And so you get this information from your e capture courses, and then you're sharing it through the kickoff meeting. So now your writers have their marching orders and they know exactly what to do on this right. And then Sorry, this may seem like a, a very like oh my goodness this process is it is it a, a challenging process yes I'm not gonna sit here and lie to you it it very much so is but is it doable yes it is doable it is doable um, it's not something that it's something it's not right. <laughs> but it is a science of, of, of the art of persuasive communication and that's what this is really what it is. All right, so let's move on a little bit because I don't want to run out of time. So blue, then then pink. Pink is really your first draft. This is really what is it that you're going to be, this is your first round. You may be taking a previous proposal or something that you've done and or then just populating your outline, that document that Comes back at the first place. At least we have included in every section. Okay? It's just, it's, it's just a thing that I'm um, just ignoring it. Okay. And so this is you're putting all this information here, you're looking at the evaluation and you're saying if they're given weight to all these different sections. I'm actually answering that, those evaluation criteria. So when we're going through it, the very sections that we look for first, I always look at section L, look at section M, look at section C. <laughs> and there are other sections that those are the ones we look at first um, to make sure that we understand what's the evaluation criteria. Um, during that pink team, again, you're, you're just pulling all the information. You want to make sure that you're being compliant. Make sure that they're you're not missing anything. And if you find that you're missing something, then you know, okay, do I need to go get a team and partner, or how, do, how am I going to fill this gap that I don't have an answer to this question that I, I'm not quite sure what to put in? And then you start building that out. So you have your your pink team, and then you're looking at your, your revenue again. All this becomes one for you because it's just you. But again, as you're growing and you start working with larger companies as well, they're they're most likely will be going through this process. Okay. okay, so then this next we call this the, the final external review because again, this is now your document is about 90% complete at this point. Um, and now as your subject matter expert. You know, Technical perspective, does this proposal, it, it answers the mail. That is, um, it gives them exactly what they're looking for. Is this sound? And that's what you're doing here. And you're going through looking at from the evaluation criteria perspective. Again, all the volumes are complete. You're, you're again around 90% done. Um, there are no holes. You shouldn't have any holes at this point. Now you're just going through the, it's almost like the, the, the cake is baked. And we get getting ready to put some icing on it. Okay, making sure that it's really good, a good document. So, goal team. This is where now the executives of the company, the owners of the company, are saying, "Okay, I sign off on this. This pricing looks good. The solution looks good, and we're ready to go." I, I feel that this is ready to go. Usually, the goal team reviewers are, like I said, the executives of the company, the, the capture manager, as well as the um, it could be the, the CEO of the company or the, uh, the VP of the business development. Again, all these people are you. So you can just don't wear different hats and different stages of the document. You're going to look at a document with different eyes. So uh, usually around this role team, you're, you're giving your blessing that, you know what, I've, I've poured it all out. I've given all I can give. I feel that this is, this is the best document I can do, put forward. This is the best proposal. That I can put forth. I'm putting forth with one what the government asked for. I made it compelling. I've shown our unique differentiators. I've shown our, our win strategy is in here. Where is it? We have some good graphics. Yeah, 
you'll be ready to go. I feel good about it. That's your goal to do. So the key stage of the process then, what, uh, what I want you to do is that, um, again, it's a very structured process. It's a, it's a process that you get to be creative and innovative and it's very um, critical, critical thinking goes into this. Um, it's, it's every aspect of business development that you can think of. It's, it's, it's the fun stuff, it's the drawing, it's the strategizing, if you really like right to strategize. Um, it's the technical side. You know, I know how to do this. Now, how do I explain on paper that I know how to do this? You know, you ever had, I know what I want to say, but I'm trying to, yeah, it's, it's pulling that out and getting it on paper. And so I always would say, if you're the one that's writing, get it out there just the way you speak, it's on the table and then clean it up. Um, the adding one to uncontaminated external checkers, are those, because you said usually the gold team are the executives. Yes. Yeah. So things? these are, I'm, I'm maybe the executives have the seen the document. Okay. But, um, but <laughs> yes, people who, maybe um, some senior people within, so I, I'll give you an example for a client. Um, as part of their gold team review, they may get a, uh, because they do military contracting, they may get a previous colonel or a two-star general, somebody who's been in the business um, and they may look at it, or somebody who's been in contracting. A lot of those contracting officers have retired. And so they may come back and be reviewers and just be consultants for some of these larger companies. And so you, they're, they haven't seen it, they're external, they're not, they're not contaminated, there's no bias. Yeah. Um, they'll have bias is what mm -hmm. I really want to say there. Um, and so, and you ask them to review the document from, just from, hey, what, what would you say about this document? Could we win? And, you know, it's just sometimes if, if and larger companies do, do this because they can afford consulting rates for these uh, retired um, federal, uh, former federal employees. And so, yeah, you want to get a few people in there just to, just to look at it, give them a blessing, and say, you know what, this is a good document. Yeah, if, I saw, if this came across my, yeah, you're, from, you're compliant, you're, and you ask them, and you give them the, uh, what you make, most times do, we give at the goal team level, we give them the um, evaluation criteria, and we say, okay. you score it. Okay. Tell us how you would score this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they will give you, oh, God, maybe give you 10 points here, because you don't really have, uh, and you try to give on the, on the scale, and you give them something to work with. And you try to just have a, a mock team that, that, that mimic the evaluator and you try to put on the evaluator hat to say, how would I really look at this document objectively? Okay, so I guess my question then is if that's the case and you're at the goal team review level and you're giving them the evaluation criteria at this level, if they see some glaringly if they see some area <laughs> that yeah. needs to be worked on, don't you kind of have to backtrack? You sure do. Okay. <laughs> That's when you start pulling them all nighters and you start putting everything in. <laughs> but yeah, but but at that, at that if you get to that point for the goal team and, you, and it's a wash and you have a really um, deep or in depth rework, uh -huh. something that's horribly gone wrong. Mm -hmm. Because that's why you have all these gate checks, because right. you're, you're checking along the way. And if you get to that point and, and you find that something is not compliant or there's a, a, a toll, yeah, that's the. Yeah, head, heads roll at that point. Okay. And that's when you thought you were stretching. <laughs> Go ahead, Shafia. Um, I would actually suggest um, an outside consultant in the sense of that person with that chief subject matter expert, that general, or that person retired from that agency mm -hmm. or knows that work, for them to really be on the red team. Mm -hmm. So in the first time they can help with the compliance of the proposal, they can read over it, and typically, you, there's, there's some mistakes there too, and you can see it early on, but then allow them back for the goal team okay. to ensure and that you close that gap. Yeah. yeah. So you so see here, it's really, it's a, it's a team effort, it's relationships. Oh my gosh, it's, I guess this is the love that you can do. But if you, everyone in the world is having like a love-hate relationship. <laughs> <laughs> and it's hated because you're like, I want to love to see my family and I would love to do this. Um, but you love it because it's just so you take nothing and you create this something and you you know especially when there's a win oh my gosh it's like you feel 
you have a massive printer. Make sure you have all that backup. Don't print the tabs yourself. Do send them on the code. It's a headache. It, that, that is the one thing that's a headache. Just send them the key codes. Um, everything else you can do in house. Um, but more so, I would say, please start two weeks early. Just to ensure that everything is. Because a, a printer will break down at 2 o'clock in the morning. Yes. Like, <laughs> it will happen. Make sure you have paper, file, and like and stack, yeah, your stacks of paper. Make sure you have binder. <laughs> yeah. How are you going to find it? I mean, that, that's important. Yeah. So we're so order that and have it ready or you know, ready for all your materials. And and because you, you want to create create one of the aspects too of um of the, the proposal manager, again you're managing the document, making sure it gets delivered. Make sure that you do have you're creating a, a checklist for a production checklist. And you're saying oh, you already know that they need five copies. Okay, you need five copies, that means you need five binders. Okay, how many pages? Is there a page that okay, so I know a hundred pages can fit inside this size, so I make sure and you Doing those things up front, again, the role of the manager, the role of you, one of the hats you're going to wear. And you're making sure that you're accounting for production early on, in, even in, in the planning process as well. Um, making sure that that takes place because, again, the day before, or print day is not the day to start thinking about your binders. Um, some people ask, well, do I, am I, can I do a spiral bound, or could I do, or should I do a three ring bound document? We use three ring binders a lot, maybe because um, the, how the government may uh, evaluate, evaluate that they take different sections. And so we want to make it easy for them. So we use a three ring binder thing. Okay, we need that section. Okay, somebody else is reviewing tab two. If you bind it by a duo bind or a spiral bound, then it's difficult, or a cone bounding, a binding, then it's difficult for them to separate it. So we want to think about those, those things as well. Um, how do we place Two, three, five pages inside of a, a three ring binder. Yes, we have. Um, but we just do whatever we need to do to make it make it easy. Um, and then we talked about this earlier, where we we have these things that happen post the middle. Again, this you might think it, oh my gosh, I thought this was a writing class. We have not we talked about writing, but again, the writing, all of this dictates how the writing is gonna go. So when we talk, when we enter the the uh, um, Book camp <laughs> on proposal writing, that we're actually going to be writing. We're actually going to be putting pen to paper, bringing your laptops with you. We're going through this. You have, if you have an RFP, we're going to go through it. If not, we're going to have some other items that we can, we can begin to start writing to see how the proposal is done. So, this right here, this is a part of the writing process as well because, again, when you submit the document, they can, the government can come back. And, they, and they'll say in the RFP, but afterwards we can we'll narrow down and you know somebody will come back for an oral presentation. Those oral presentations now, that's you as well. You're taking, you created the, the PowerPoint for the oral presentation. Um, you're going to be the one that's actually putting those documents together for your best and final offer. Okay? So that's something that you're going to be doing as well. All right. Agility, flexibility, that is, it is the key. It, it really is the key. Have I seen um, proposals that are exactly the same every year, even if it's something that I've done in the past? No. There's always some type of change because what the government may need may change. The environment changes, you know, the political environment, the, the social environment, the, the environment environment, <laughs> all of that changes. And so you and, and so therefore, because there's a change, that RFP is written. Um, as a result of the change that the government wants to and needs to experience. And so now you're telling them now this change that they're experiencing becomes an opportunity for you. And so you, now you're being able to really take advantage of this opportunity that's now presented. So being flexible, um, uh, no, no, no proposal plan ever dies. Yeah. You change, you change all the time, you're being flexible. Um, the process is only good. I mean, you're the one executing the process. So I can have the best roadmap in the world, and that's even when you're looking at your, your proposal, you can have the best um, technical approach in the world, but it's only as good as their management plan. And you tell them who's going to do it, when they're going to do it, what's, what's the level of, um, what's the uh, service level, the quality that we're, we're going for. You, you have to really look at how it all fits together. Um, to get a, the, the perfect solution. Oh, sorry. 
And again, right here, so no, it's, it's not going to be perfect. Like, will you submit that proposal thinking, man, if we had just added one more thing, yes. And will you be tortured at night thinking about it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but the next proposal is going to come along and you're going to be like, okay, well, okay, move right along. And you got to be able to do that. So one of the things, and I, I'm, I'm going to pass this around, but um, I just want to give you an idea of what a proposal can sometimes look like. And your proposal may be smaller, um, but, you, but I'm just going to give you an idea. So you may be saying to yourself, all right, then I'm just going to go ahead and put together the proposal, and put my logo on there, and put this, and then we're going to submit. You can do that. That's fine. However, you can just put some pictures on. If you have a, a, a medical business, Put some you know, pictures on there. Um, these are stock photos that you actually um, pay for, but go ahead and, and use them. See how you can design a cover. You don't have to use pictures, but have a nice design cover if you can. So what, what we do, we also design the spine. Starting out, you don't have to do all of this. This is a, a larger company. This is not, um, I mean, gosh, I could show you some proposal covers. But you'd be like, oh my gosh, is that a proposal or magazine? What is that? Um, and for those people who are online, this is what I'm showing them. It's just a proposal to give you an idea. So you put all the information, submit it to, submit it from, by, the name of the contract, the RFP number, the name of the opportunity, the due date, all of that goes there. And then you have here um, your table of contents that you're putting in. Right, <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> Um, and in this proposal, they, they ask for, we want, we want you to give us the VI, so we need to be laying this out. Now, this is a state contract. State proposals are different than federal proposals, but I want to give you an idea of the presentation that you're going to give. The reason why this is important, and, and even from a proposal writing perspective, when you think about a proposal, that's what it is. It's, you're making an offer. I am making you this offer that I will do this work for you. Right? That's what it is. You're proposing something. And you want to make it look good because it really gives now, uh, again, one of those subliminal things of a, an idea of what kind of work we're going to get from you. Right. You're just going to throw something together, you're talking things on the paper, and dog hairs, and all those different things. Mm. Yeah, you're going to cut in some corners and maybe you're not organized. It tells something about you. And I, I do this with my class, and I, I think it's, I think it's, it's still relevant. When you think about a proposal, think about it as just just that, in the simplest form of proposal. When when either a guy came up to you or in high school and guys when you went up to a girl, you're not going with your dirty shoes on. You're not going with uh, hey baby, can I get them digits? You're you're gonna go with some some classic stuff. You're not gonna go with some so you don't want to seem regular. So just like your document, you don't want to seem regular. You want to look I'm going to put my best forward, past my effort forward. When I'm coming to you um, to propose something, I'm, I'm, not, I'm going to do my best because I want you to say yes. It depends on if you want the person to say yes. If it's a quality person, quality girl, you go, okay, put the best before. Um, but if you have, if God, if, for, for the ladies here, if you see the guys with uh, mesh, mesh shoes and half of their heels gone on one side of the shoe, what are you thinking? Yeah, and you can hear like, oh, yeah, we may have talk. Yeah, yeah, clearly those shoes have been walking a long time. What I'm saying is, <laughs> what I'm saying is, the physical presentation, even on your document, matters. The physical presentation of your proposal, the words you say, matters. How you look matters when you're making a proposal, okay? And these are tabs that were not, these are tabs that were printed. So you see how much nicer they look as if, um, and this one should have flipped through. This, this document is not a great proposal, but I wanted to show you the layout. This is actually one I had in the office. Um, I'm just going to let you pass around and flip through. And the reason why it's not great, and it's funny, tell me why it's not great. Um, it's not a great document, but it's, uh, it's pretty. So you want to sometimes pretty get you in the door sometimes, right? right. right. And then you start talking and you're like, oh crap. We want to get in the door. So we, we're going to use everything that we have to make sure that we get in the door and that we get the 
All right, so I know we're three minutes before 12, so I'm just a question. So um, a Swiss cheese template, because obviously, you know, winning, you know, is, is how you keep your business going, how you right. keep people employed. And I would love to be able to prove the, the, the rate that I'm able to produce these type of proposals, but I'm still, you know, tiny. So I'm just curious, is there like a Swiss cheese, like you must have this on hand. So I identify the RFP that I want to respond to. What must I have already in place? So every time I'm responding, I'm not starting from square one in my right hand. I would say if you have um, a building out of, but it's only if you have previous proposals and you have a response database. If you, and you start looking at your previous proposals and, and creating a database. Okay, this is how I, this is a good answer when they ask me about a management plan. Okay, this is a good answer when you're talking about fault. Build your own um, database. So now when you get in that pink team, that pink, that first draft, you're pulling from that database to really give you a good start. Um, and then also having a, 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 a template, a response template. That document there is just a template. We've already had headers, we already had footers. Um, we had it all formatted already, and now we're just populating it with um, our headings were already formatted, and so now you're just changing the format, you're writing the words, and then using the formatting feature within Word. Um, so it's part of your desktop publishing, so you know a good desktop publisher, or, or maybe you're it, that's fine. And you, you just you have a standard template. Um, sometimes for larger companies, every time there's a new proposal opportunity, they may have a new cover. And so this army, we're gonna put army images in there and making sure it's the right branch of the army. They can do that, but you may have a standard cover that you may have that just reflects your business. So if you're medical, if that company was medical, they just had medical images. They use that cover for all their documents. So they're not starting from scratch every single time. But it happens, you build that stuff over time. So you're building your data build. Any other questions? Um, okay, so I'm going to ask a question based on a lot of our, our current members. If, if you're trying to win your first one and you're struggling with some of the, okay, well, I mean, all I do is staffing or providing people or all I do is, you know, I, I don't do something that's super technical or there's, you know, like rocket science. You ask for, 25 widgets and I'm giving you 25 widgets. How do you make that all the same thing? Yeah. So I guess that's one question. And then how do you overcome that whole passive thing to struggle through to get the first one? Yeah. So it's a two part question. Yeah. <laughs> so with, with past performance, oh my gosh, I, I've, I've seen some companies still with the past performance. People are like, oh, I didn't know that thing there. But for past performance, you can, that's where your, your team and partners may come into play. Um, see if you may actually have some additional um, um, past performance or you can bring in somebody else on your actual team. Because some RFPs may actually say, fine needs to have, or from your allowed, let's say, five past performance, but three of them need to come from the prime. Mm -hmm. and, if, and if that's the case and you're the prime, then um, you may have some challenges there, but you may need to can hire somebody or look at the weight. If past performance is about 20 or 10%, okay, and just think, I'm gonna get given, okay. But I mean, your management and your technical and everything else need to be top notch. Mm -hmm. So you really don't throw them away yet. Just think about how, you know, if it's through teaming or through, through bringing somebody else on board. Um, have we gone to. <laughs> But there could also be a provision in the application that prohibits you from doing some of those things. So there's no really unique approach to that providing with this yeah. or you know getting you the supplies you need or whatever. Yeah. So, so let's say that you have a let's say something that's staffing. And you go, okay, it's just people. 
It can be how do you source your people? Are you a good company that people actually stay with you? Mm -hmm. How do you manage them? What's what's your compensation uh, plan? What what benefits do you do you require? Because the government knows if you offer good benefits and your salary rates are you know within a within a level where it needs to be, they know that good people stay with good companies and good managers. How are you managing them? But if, if you don't have a good track record of how you treat your people. You, the way you treat your people can, can be a differentiator. The, the tenure that they have, how long do they stay with you, um, that can be a good indicator. Um, some, sometimes it's, it's the quality of people that you're, you have and you're able to provide can also be a differentiator that you may have. Um, how, again, how you source them. Um, do you have a pool of people or are you starting from scratch every single time you're trying to find new people? So um, all those things can really matter uh, how you do it. Um, do you keep a pool of people that and maybe um, if something happens, you're able to wrap up another person within 24 hours or 48 hours? You know what I mean? It's like you're really thinking through, well, gosh, yeah, it may be the same as everybody else. However, the way I do it will show your differentiator there. Yeah. And really, um, one of the things about getting people is also, you know, partnering with different schools and different associations and things of that nature where you're, you're showing them that you're getting the best of the best. So you have a pool that you can pull from if you're doing nursing. Partnering with some nursing schools so you get some people um, in the same area. So I'm not sure there was you or you, but someone mentioned that there was an association for grant writers that meet regularly. Uh, an association of proposal management professionals. It's Georgia chapter that they here in Atlanta, and so they meet um, once once a month or that once every two months now, I think. Uh, but yeah, they're here in Atlanta, and we have a, a conference that's coming up um, November. No, sorry, March 20th and 21st. Yeah. So yeah. Um, so yeah. So that's what, what we have today. Any questions at all? I guess I want to round up. How many of you? Feel that hey, you know what? Yeah, it's gonna be some work. I feel I can do it. I feel I can do it. Yeah. I feel I can do it. Okay, well, that's good. Yeah, well, that, I think that that's. Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 You, you can do the start. Yeah. 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 Journey a thousand miles to get to one step. Yeah. 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 Start, and you can you can do it. And you have help along the way. And this organization is a great organization to help you. Along the way, you have that along the way. It measures in software or is it a Gantt? A Gantt chart? Oh, it's Microsoft project. Yeah, Microsoft project. And what you're creating in Microsoft project, that image that we saw, that's called a Gantt chart. And you see timelines and yeah, it's a Gantt chart. But the software is Microsoft project. So this is kind of like Random question, but do you have a book or a speaker or a blog that inspires you, whether it's in writing or whether it's in contract, which is something that kind of inspires you or, help, or that you could have us listen or read about um, or technical writing? Yeah, or, yeah. So, the, the, so when I taught, I, I, there was a textbook that I used, and there's also um, Shipley's. Shipley has um, writing classes as well as for, for capture from Ezra as well as writing Shipley Corporation. Which is their, which they're called uh, Shipley Associates. Ship, Shipley yeah. Associates. And then the gentleman over there, sorry, sir, um, could you hold the two books that you showed me earlier today? So these are two books that, when, when did you find those? I actually worked with them online. Okay, so one is called Handbook for Writing Proposals, and the other one is Persuasive Business Proposals. And, and Tom stands, he's, he's a great guy. He's the, probably the second or third book. So, so they're on Amazon. There are a lot of information that you can get. Um, and then there's some online classes um, that you can take. In terms of being a proposal writer, putting this in context, um, I, the, my love is for technical communication. And proposal writing is a part of that. It's this. Uh, Explaining technical information to a non technical audience. And we know it's my degree way back when in the session. Oh, okay. you're in so the so I'm like, okay, oh, this is not the book. You're going to go back to work right now. Yeah, you, it's, you, it's in there. Okay. Yeah, it, it gets in your blood. I, I always say proposal management. I know sometimes they joke about it, it's like the mafia. Once you get in, you can't, <laughs> once you get in, you can't get out. It gets into your blood, and it's just like, and you fight to get out, but it's like, no. <laughs> Stimulated and always after the next punch. 
So just in terms of um, very small business managing expectations, I'm just curious what you've seen historically in terms of success rate. You know what I mean? So I, it may, I don't know if it's realistic for me to expect that I'm going to be successful in winning 100% of the time. And I know that there's a lot of variance in terms of what determines what, how people win. But I'm just wondering in general, can yeah. you just give me an idea of what the success rate is that you commonly see or a reasonable expectation I should have all things to be considered. You know what I mean? If I'm writing good, I'm putting together good proposals, if I'm if I'm following, you know, the, the, the instructions and guidelines to submit it, I'm getting things in, you know, timely, I'm making everything beautiful in my presentation, just a reasonable expectation in terms of success rate. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, I was gonna say, Myra, if you wanna answer that question. You, you asked that question last week. Right, yeah. Um, as far as that, we, we and, and I, I don't know where we've done this, but um, the average person, they win one out of 20 days, which is four. But um, we found that our GCA members generally win one of one of every six. Uh -huh. And some of our more successful ones, like I think Ellen was winning one of every three that she was submitting, but those were the GSA schedule type of contracts. Mm -hmm. And I think Carlos he said that his ratio to about one four. But yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. 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 And so it's really one of those things where yeah, it's getting the game and started. So look at the RP and Your business may be sinking. 
Right. But you're gonna, they don't hold you to that. So really be from a writing perspective, we can do from a writing perspective, go ahead and, and bid for what it's really worth, um, and then write to really show value. Write to really show how your product, your service, give them the same, or give them even better than the larger companies, because now you're more agile, you're more responsive. You're, you're being able to say that, hey, you have all my attention, but you might need a contract. <laughs> Whereas, hey, you, you're only one of many, you go right. around. To right. me, you're going to be everything, and I'm going to give you everything. Right. And so, you know, they get to, not like that, but write it in a way where they, they do feel that and they do see that. So, yeah, go for it all. Go for it all, whatever you can get. But really, shave costs where you can. However, don't do it at the reduction of that. If you want to add something, spend a little time. Um, I was into the other part of it. If you look at it from another perspective, smaller business have lower overhead. Mm -hmm. right? When it comes to your rack rate, it is easier for you to have a lower rack rate than a larger company, right? There's more GA overhead. So that's why your cost is going to be lower anyway. Right? Let's say try to work your opportunities under bid, you don't have to provide. But right. let's know that a smaller company with a smaller overhead, your rack rate is lower, therefore your cost is going to be lower. And a lot of the questions that some of you all are starting to ask are some of the things that are taught here at UCA. And so if you're interested in uh, finding out more information about how to join UCA, feel free to use the Richard group or you can see a phone in the back. Ms. Myra Cisse, who's our president. Or you see myself why I have the membership and events as well here. So we can tell you more about other things that are coming. Um, and also, I want to make a comment about the small business owners uh, thing that you brought know, certification that you brought up. Great reference to what we're dealing with right now. So right now, being a small business owner, is you have an advantage of being a small business owner uh, certified as a woman owner. I, uh, Minority owner. Right. So do you know right now that there's a uh, a bill, well, not a bill, but uh, legislation in place to try to move it, set aside, and so that it would be more of a challenge for you to win opportunities? Does everyone in the room know that? Right. Okay, so let me announce that now. We can share everyone knows about that. And this is going to affect possibly all of our businesses if we do not stand up and say something about this. And I'm speaking to those online as well. When you see the email go out, can you please read through it, understand that there is uh, a panel, 809 panel, that's already made recommendations to Congress to eliminate small business set aside. And this is not good. This is not a good thing. Uh, we at the EPA have an advocacy committee that's already in place, that's working on collecting signatures. Uh, we have a member here that's on the committee, and she may want to share something later with you all. But I just want to make sure you all take action, spread the word, please sign the petition. Please talk to your congressman and let them know that we do not appreciate and do not support the best of the rules set aside. And um, and last but not least, yes, I can be coming at the, the webinar that's on March the 12th. That's going to give all the information. Oh, oh, thank you. In fact, we'll forward that out. On March 12th, there'll be a webinar being done by 8, I think. By eight, yes, right, so not from 12 to 1, about educating people on the field and telling us about what well, this uh, recommendation about. List, I think it's like 93 recommendations that have been made to eliminate uh, the set aside. Like I said, it's not easy. Um, so, March 12th, mark the calendar for that. 12 1, you'll see an email. You can register for that as a free webinar and you can send that out to your, your circle of influence as well. Now, I also want to make sure that everyone has a slide about the boot camp. Ms. Kira will be leading our boot camp on March 8th, a Friday. If you're interested in signing up for that, you can also see Richard, myself, and Myra, who you sign up for that today. But it's an all day writing class, writing lab, taught by Ms. Kira. If you have a potential, I think you said they can bring a potential RFP in. If you're looking at something that you're interested in writing on, bring that with you. And uh, please be sure you've read it first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Questions 
So for members, it's only four ninety nine for that class, and if you're not a member, it's nine ninety nine, nine hundred ninety nine dollars. So is March eighth the only day that um, so the that is available? We may have another one later in the year, okay. but you know this is the beginning of the year. I do know right now that one is on the calendar, right. and maybe one later on this time. Okay. Good question. Any other questions? Um, and then uh, back to the 809 panel, if you um, want to follow us on social media, we've got a link, I, I, I've got posts that go out every week, so the link to the petition is out there, yes. so just follow us so, on social media. So, Myra just said online, if you go to our Facebook page, Government, I think it's Government Contracts Association, if you go out there and follow us, you will see all the posting, the videos, and everything about uh, the 809 panel. All right. So thank you. Thank you. Did anybody find the? What did you think about the proposal? Did you see something? Um, one of the things that um, I guess that really stuck out to me was like you get the thing to talk about the sections, and I noticed that she said this was the federal and that's the state, but they had a lot of subsections that they didn't make it easy to get to. Okay. Oh, with, with the numbering? Like, well, they had the, the tabs, but then, like, in a lot of places I've seen, like, A and B, but it didn't make it easy to get to that. You had to go through the whole document to get to those specific points. Got it. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, do you want, uh, this is Kelowna? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you get something for that, just for... So what else? What did you about like for what? I know you didn't get to answer this question.